Welcome to Anchors of Truth, live from the 3ABN Worship Center, A River Within, with C.A. Murray. Hi, thank you for joining us this morning. I hope you all are happy in the Lord. Isn't it great when Sabbath rolls around and uh, we can come and be in the house of worship here at 3ABN, but for those of you joining us around the world, thank you for your love and your prayers and financial support of 3ABN as we endeavor to take this great gospel of the kingdom into all the world. Ministry that's been here over 30 years with God's blessing continues to grow year after year, and thank you for what you do. Anchors of Truth is a, is a great time every month, and when we get different speakers, our speaker today is a very special friend to me, has been for many, many years. The first time I knew about C.A. Murray, we were asked, Melody and me, in about, I think it was 2003 possibly, to go to New York sing in a camp meeting. There was going to be 10 or 12,000 people. Molly Steenson said, they want you, to, you and Melody to sing a new song she's written, I Know the Plans that Melody had written. So she said, but I want to let you know there's a man there that's going to sing with you. And I said, what? She said, there's a pastor there, and he said he's going to get up and sing with you. I said, no, he isn't. I don't know this pastor. I don't know if he can carry a tune. I don't even know if he knows the song. Well, he wants to sing that with you. So I said, well, what's his name? She said, Pastor C.A. Murray. He's going to be there. I said, well, tell you what we'll do. We'll try him out. I said, before the service, we'll try him out. Well, we did. And, of course, he knew the song already. knew it better than I did, actually. And uh, this first time I ever met Pastor C.A. Murray. What a blessing that he's been in my life as far as ministry is concerned and then also just as a friend, he and Irma, what special people they are. I praise God to be able to work with these folk every day. And C.A. has got such an anointing that God has given him to preach the gospel uh, literally around the world. And God has given him musical abilities. He's the general manager of the Proclaim Network. And uh, so praise the Lord for Pastor C.A. Murray. Also today, we have some special music, some of our young folk. How many like Sierra young folk up here, right? All right, we have Farrah Berry on the piano, and we have Marcus Gonzalez. And uh, you're going to be doing, they're going to be doing this song, Peace as the Deer Panteth for the Water. And then right after that, the next voice you'll hear will be Pastor C.A. Murray.
Amen and amen. Well done. Thank you so very, very much. I'm going to ask you to um, do me the great favor of trying to come back this afternoon if you can. Something occurred to me about 2 o'clock this morning as I was writing, and I fell upon something that I began to play with some 20 years ago, and it occurred to me that it connects with what we were talking about this morning, and I should like to suggest something to you this afternoon uh, as we close out this series. So we ask for it just in your prayers this morning and again this afternoon. Turn with me, if you will, to the gospel as written by John. Chapter 4 and verse 9. John chapter 4. We begin at verse 9. You are no doubt familiar with the story, so we will not recount all of it in our scripture lesson, save to highlight and showcase certain aspects of the story that are germane to our discussion. John chapter 4, beginning at verse 9. The Bible says, Then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. I'm reading from the New King James. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is that says to you, give me a drink. You would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as well as his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain or a river of water springing up to everlasting life. Gracious Father, we ask for the presence and power of your Spirit. We come expecting a blessing. Do not disappoint, for we wait upon you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I brought my Mishnah with me this morning. I don't know if I'll get a chance to read from it. I may have to just refer to it. The term Samaritan appears only once in the Old Testament. It is found in 2 Kings chapter 17, verse 29. It refers to the citizens of the former kingdom of Israel, the northern tribes. Later, the term was applied to the city and the surrounding district, of which Samaria, the city, was the political hub and also the religious center. The origin of Samaria as an entity is found in 2 Kings chapter 17, verses 24 through 34. We don't have time to read all of that. But after King tiglath pileser and later Sargon, and for those of you who are trivia buffs, when Ellen White was sent to Australia in the 1890s, she had a dog, 
I believe it was a German Shepherd or Shepherd mix. She named that dog Tiglath Pileser. So she did have a sense of humor. So Tiglath and later Sargon carried most of the population of Israel into exile. The Assyrians had this idea that when they conquered a nation, they tried to replace the people who are there with an imported people in trying to totally destroy the history of the people whom they conquered. So the Assyrians displaced the original Israelis and replaced them with Babylonians, people from Mesopotamia, and people from Hamath in Syria. And these people brought with them their own religion, their own beliefs, which intermingled with the religion of the small number of Jews that remain. The worship of Jehovah eventually won out, but it was adulterated by the pagan beliefs of those who the Assyrians brought in for that particular purpose. So these foreigners never really let go of their gods and their religion was intermingled with the pure Jewish religion and became the religion of the Samaritans. Josiah was able to reconquer much of Samaria under his great revival. But the influences were always there, and the religion in Samaria was always somewhat more liberal, shall we say, than the religion of those in Judah. And under the watch of these pagan influences, the religion of God was nearly erased, but not totally. So when Judah returned from Babylonian captivity, they viewed the Samaritans as half-breeds, traitors to the faith, and turncoats. And that was the animus or the genesis of the animus between Samaritans and Jews. The Samaritans later asked to join the Jews in the rebuilding of the temple. They were rebuffed. The Jews rejected that request. They tried to help them rebuild the city. The Jews would not allow it. Zerubbabel, Yeshua, and the others rejected outright the offer of Samaritan aid because they didn't want to be contaminated with this half-breed religion. You follow me? The Jews, for their part, were concerned about the Samaritans practicing a corrupt religion, and they didn't want to be part of that. They didn't want to get soiled with Samaritan impurities. So the Samaritans stopped the rebuilding of the wall by force for a time. They burned the gates of Jerusalem, tore down sections of the wall, and generally harassed Nehemiah and others who were trying to rebuild the temple and the city of Jerusalem. Nehemiah describes in some detail how Sanballat, the Samaritan governor, made attempts to hinder the work we find that in Nehemiah 4 and 6. Josephus says, the Samaritans were the kind of people who claimed to be Jews when it was to their advantage. But when being a Jew was unpopular, the Samaritans had nothing to do with them. When the Seleucid king Antiochus IV, Antiochus Epiphanes, tried to Hellenize the community of Israel and tried to turn everybody into Greeks and make them behave as Greeks, the Jews resisted and suffered severe persecution. The Samaritans dedicated their temple on Mount Gerizim to Zeus, the defender of strangers. So they were kind of a go-with-the-flow people, path of least resistance. 
So when the Jews began to rebound in the days of the Maccabees, John Hyrcanus went north and burned down the Samaritan temple on Mount Gerizim. So by the time of Christ, the hatred was centuries old and mutual. Jews hated Samaritans. Samaritans hated Jews. So much so that this Mishnah says a traveler traveling from Galilee to Jerusalem would avoid passing through Samaria, which was the most direct route at all costs. He would even go into the foreign land of Perea to avoid touching or having anything to do with Samaritans. Interestingly enough, the anthro historians say if you go to the north of Israel today, there are descendants of those original Samaritans worshiping and living there to this very day. But in the days of the New Testament, the Jews were possessed of a species of institutional and societal racism. And it wasn't just a matter of that, that Jews, Jews didn't like Samaritans. They looked down on them as inferior, unpure, and treacherous. It is said in one of the old Talmudic prayers that the lords of the temple often prayed, Lord, I am glad I am not lame. I am glad I am not a woman. And I am glad that I am not a Samaritan. So now you have the background of the meeting between Jesus and a woman that was now in her sixth relationship, five husbands and one common-law paramour at the well of Sychar. Jesus now has to cut through nearly 700 years of animosity, bigotry, mistrust, racism, and suspicion. This woman at the well was looked down upon by any Jew. She was looked down upon by her own Samaritan people. Married men shunned her. Single women shunned her. Married women shunned her. And she didn't have many friends. Ellen White says the animosity between Jew and Samaritan was so strong and so ingrained that even, even the disciples, it didn't occur to them to do something nice for her. She had a reputation, and it was not good, which is precisely why she was getting water at 12 o'clock noon. In the hottest part of the day, the respectable ladies had already gotten their water in the cool of the morning. They would have been talking. There would have been laughter, sharing a little gossip, maybe even talking about her. But that was done at 6 a.m., 7 a.m., maybe 8 a.m. Nobody got water at 12 noon. It's too hot. It's too miserable. So she waits until everyone is gone. And she goes to get her water. No normal person, no person of repute would get water at the sixth hour. And that is precisely why she is there. So when she gets there, there is only one person there. And praise God, he is anything but normal. Now, you've got you've to you've like Jesus as a tactician. But Ellen White says that there was the well, and then there was this wall around the well. And Jesus plants himself on that wall right around the well. So she cannot ignore him. She cannot miss him. She's got to go around him to do what she wants to do. Christ is right in her way. And Ellen White says she pretends like he's not even there. 
because that's how Jews treat Samaritans, and that's how Samaritans treat Jews. But Ellen White says she did have a passing interest in the scriptures. She was in the right state of mind. She was tired of the old life. She had been through five marriages and was in common law relationship with the six. And Ellen White says, and this is interesting, Christ revealed to this woman, and we will get to this in a little bit, things that he never told any Jew. He didn't even tell Nicodemus, and he didn't even tell his own disciples. He gave her information that the Jews never got, and even the disciples didn't get till the very end. He gave it to her that day. There are important lessons that we can learn from the lesson at the well. Number one, Christ is no respecter of persons. Praise God. Doesn't matter what your reputation is. Doesn't matter what you've done. Doesn't matter where you come from. Doesn't matter if you're rich or poor, black or white, tall or thin, educated, uneducated. He's no respecter of persons. So her past made no difference to Jesus. Praise God. So I can apply that to me. My past makes no difference to Jesus. And surprise, surprise, your past. Mm -hmm. Makes no difference to Jesus. You see, the situation between Jews and Samaritans was so bad that not only would a Jew not do a favor for a Samaritan, he wouldn't accept a favor from a Samaritan. Right here in the book. Got it right here. Don't have time really to read it all. Won't take anything from you. Won't give you anything. In fact, the Mishnah says, better to die of thirst than accept a glass of water from a Samaritan. So I'm not doing anything for you, and I will not allow you to do anything for me. So Christ's request Give me a drink of water is shocking. First of all, you got a man speaking to a woman at high noon. You got a man speaking to a woman that he does not know at high noon. You got a man who was a Jew speaking to a Samaritan at high noon at a well. Shocking. And then he asks her for a favor. She would have never ask him for anything. 700 years of bad blood prevented it. But this request immediately said to her, this Jew, Roy, is different. And if you follow the story to its logical end, Shelley, you find out he never did get that drink of water. Never did. Because water wasn't the issue. It, well, let me put it this way. Water was the issue but not H2O. So Christ gets down to it. NIV puts it this way. If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water, John 4.10. At that point, she knew she had heard something important. She knew something had gone by her. She knew something had hit her ears. She didn't quite know what it meant. She didn't quite know what it was. She didn't quite know how to, how to decipher it. She just knew somebody had said something to her that was important, and she needed to kind of stick with it. Ellen White says, Christ let her lead the conversation. You got to like Jesus', Jesus, Jesus tact. He let her think she was running the show. You can drive the bus. So he let her lead the conversation, and for a while, he chose to follow her. Now, she didn't know it was going, where it was going, but Jesus did. So she said, how are you going to give me water? Well, it's deep. You don't have anything to get water with. So how are you going to give me this living water? Where can you get living water? Are you greater than Jacob? See, this lady had heard eternal truth. Her religion was corrupted, but it wasn't totally wrong. She knew about the past. She knew about Father Abraham. She knew about Jacob's well. The desire of Aziz, the desire of Aziz quote, to quote says, 
she, she was engaging Jesus in, in what Ellen White calls a light bantering manner. Now, I didn't want to um, assume what that meant. And, and Irma said to me this morning, she said, you spend too much time looking up words. So, but I wanted to check out bantering. And, and, and bantering says an exchange of light, playful, teasing remark. So she started off kind of playing with Jesus, perhaps even flirting with him. I mean, that's, she knew how to handle guys. She had five husbands and living with number six. She know what guys like, what, what guys like, and how to handle guys. So she's playing with Jesus for a little bit. But Jesus wasn't playing with her. Jesus was trying to save her soul. Second lesson. It doesn't matter what others think about you. The only person you have to contend with is the one who can save your soul in heaven or send your soul to hell. And that is Jesus. So when she asked him, are you greater than Jacob? Christ could have said, sure am. You got it right. But he doesn't even bother with that question. Doesn't even answer it. Just goes beyond it. He gets back to the real issue because the real issue isn't Jacob. The real issue is water. So in John 4, 13, he says, Everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. Praise God. But the water that I shall give him, he will become, in, will become in him a fountain, a river of water springing up into everlasting life. Now, she knew now that this guy was different. She wants that water, but thinks it's going to solve her present problems. She has yet to clue into the fact that the person talking to her isn't really talking about water Water is a metaphor for what she needs to save her soul. So she says, give me this water. Sounds good, I want it. First of all, I don't want to get thirsty again. And secondly, I don't want to have to ever have to come here again and face this humiliation. Going to that well, you see, brothers and sisters, was a daily humiliation for this woman. The very fact that she's drawing water in the heat of the day at 12 noon is humiliation. Lord, I'll do anything so I don't have to come here for the rest of my life and humiliate myself day after day after day, lonely, by myself, sun beating down, no one to help me, everybody talking about me, everybody shunning me. I'll take that water if it will free me from this. She was thinking, here's my chance to shed some shame and Christ wanted to help her with that and so much more. You've, you, you've got to love. Well, let me say this. You know, everything that touches you touches Jesus. Did you know that? Did you know that? Everything that concerns you concerns Jesus. You understand that? You understand that? Those things that you are concerned about concern Jesus. Amen. Amen. Jesus is concerned about the things that concern you. You understand that? Jesus is concerned about those things that we are too concerned about. Mm -hmm. And Jesus is concerned about those things that don't concern us. Amen. Get the tape. You'll understand it. And you've got to love Christ's next line. Jesus is a master tactician. He's got her on the hook. She's listening. Her heart is opened. Next line. Right cross. Go get your husband. And come back. Go get him and bring him back. Her immediate response, I don't have a husband. 
And Ellen White says she was hoping by that statement to cut off any kind of discussion in that direction. She was hoping to, hoping to cut Christ off at the past. Don't have a husband. Let's press on to something else. Because she didn't want him going down that path. But Jesus was trying to get her to see who she was as a sinner so she could understand who he was as her Savior. Amen. Christ had to get her to understand her position so that he could take her from where she was to where he wanted her to be. So he's got to get her to face the fact that she is a sinner and that he is her Savior. Very, very important to know where you are so that you can know where you're going. So the bantering now becomes sparring. I have no husband. And in her mind, that was that. Game, set, match, period, exclamation point. Don't have a husband. Let's go on to the next subject. She didn't want to go there. Ellen White says she hoped, she wanted to prevent all questions in that direction. That was the reason she was gathering water at 12 o'clock instead of 6 a.m. Because she had five and was working on number six. Jesus, brothers and sisters, promises to give you not only what you want, but what you need. And sometimes what you need over what you want. Because the Bible says sometimes we pray for things we want that we shouldn't pray for because we don't really know what we want. Amen. So he may give you what you want, but he will give you what you need. And he was looking past her wants to her needs. So he had to make her a little uncomfortable before he would elevate her. So the Savior cuts her no slack because he knows what she needs and what she really needs is a Savior. Bring your husband back and we'll talk. I don't have one. I know. Your statement is true. You've had five. You've been to the altar five times, and you didn't bother going to the altar this time. You're just shacking with him. And Ellen White says, for the first time in this whole conversation, she got scared. Wouldn't you? It's time to get scared. You got to remember in those days, no newspaper, no radio, no TV, no internet, no Google. She didn't put anything on Facebook. Here's a total stranger. He's from a nation of people that hates their guts. She's a woman alone talking to a male Jew at high noon, no less, who was a total foreign stranger, and he's putting her business in the street like it's on the History Channel. Ellen White says she trembled. She got scared. Wouldn't you? Total stranger comes up to you, asks you for water, and then begins to get in your business. And says, Shelly, get your husband. I don't have a husband. You're right. J.D.'s not your husband. You've had Danny and Jim and Greg and Jeff and Time to get scared. You meet a man who's never seen you before in your life, and he knows you like a book. And Ellen White says she trembled. Five husbands. Your current is not your husband. 
So now the sparring becomes reverence, becomes reverence, and she's still trying to change the subject. And Christ allows her to drive the bus just a little bit further. I see that you're a prophet. Well, hello. She's trying to change the prophet. Lesson number three, nothing is hidden from Jesus. You can't hide anything from Jesus. And I'm so glad that Christ knows everything about us and loves us still. Amen. Amen. See, we, we, I said so many, we all got stuff. I got stuff, you got stuff, all God's children got stuff, everybody's got stuff. And I think if we all knew everything about each other, <laughs> there's some stuff about me you don't want to know. Suspect there's some stuff about you I don't want to know. But Jesus knows it. And loves you still. There are no surprises with Jesus. And he's letting her know, I know about all of your stuff. And I can fix that stuff. Nothing hidden from Christ. In fact, the truth is, Christ does his best work, ladies and gentlemen, in pig pen lies. Amen? That's his best work in lives that are totally messed up. That's when Christ is at his best. When you throw up your hands in disgust and say, there's nothing I can do with the mess I've made, but make more mess. Jesus says, give it to me. I can clean it. I was up the other night trying to find some stuff and turn on the TV real quick, and there was a commercial on for the world's greatest vacuum cleaner. Cleans up messes. So does Jesus. The world's greatest vacuum cleaner. Cleans up messes. And so he knows all about her life. This lady is the poster child for mixed up existences. She's from a hated race. She's from a despised faith. From misplaced belief. Convoluted marriage situation. And actively living in adultery. Doesn't get any worse than that. She's an outcast in her own community, hated by Jews and Samaritans alike, and an outcast in her own town. And Jesus is about, is about to fix it all. So she changes the subject one last time, and Christ allows her to do it. Ellen White says the Holy Spirit is moving. Christ lets her steer the situation just a little bit longer because he knew where it was going to end. She tries to bring in a little controversy to try to get him off the path. So she says, you know, some people say we ought to worship in Jerusalem. And my people say, we ought to worship up here. You figure Christ will get into that controversy like everybody else does. And Christ tells her, the issue is not where. The issue is who and how. Same thing Shelley said couple months back. It's not where you worship. Nothing more important about worshiping in Thompsonville than worshiping in Marion. It ain't where. It's who. And how. The time is coming. In fact, now is, because I'm standing right in front of you, that God is going to reject places because he doesn't dwell in places. He dwells in hearts. You remember the very first night I told you how ridiculous it was that the children of Israel hung their harps on the, on the willows because they were thinking about Jerusalem? 
Jerusalem can't save you. Neither can Thompsonville. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Because it's not where. It's who. And how. And God can find you in Babylon just like he can find you in Jerusalem. And God can find you in Damascus just like he can find you in Jerusalem. And God can find you in your home just like he can find you in the Thompsonville Seventh-day Adventist Church. Now that's not a call to stay home. It's an assurity that wherever you go, God is with you. So Christ is saying what God wants is pure hearts and worship in spirit and in truth. That's who he's seeking. He's trying to let her know Samaria, Jerusalem, that's not the issue. Interestingly enough, Ellen White says he could have never made that statement in Jerusalem. Wasn't going to fly there because the Jews were too hung up on the temple. They felt that once you left the temple, you got lost. And God couldn't find you anymore. Which is why when the temple was destroyed and they were in Babylon, when they should have been singing the Lord's song, they were hanging their hearts harps on the willows and whining about Jerusalem. Nothing sacred about Jerusalem. Ladies and gentlemen, forgive me for saying this, there's nothing sacred about the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I repeat what I said the other night. It is blasphemous, but it is blasphemously true. Every Christian is not a Seventh-day Adventist. Amen. Amen. And every Seventh-day Adventist mm -hmm. See, it's not about the name. It's about Jesus in your heart. Now, is the Seventh-day Adventist church the right church? Now, we'll use that bigoted, isolationist term. Is it? Mm -hmm. I have no doubt about that. But Seventh-day Adventist, as a name, doesn't save you. We have heard the joyful sound. Jesus saves. Amen? So if you're in the church and not in Christ, you are lost. Because it's not about the name and it's not about the place. It's about who and how. And that's what he needed her to understand at that moment. It's about who and how. So he never, that, that is a message he never gave to the Jews. They never heard that from his lips because they wouldn't have accepted it. Too self-righteous, too into the temple, and too bigoted. But that was the clincher for that woman. Now get this statement. This statement in John chapter 4, 21 to 24. Christ deliberately kept this from the Jews because they weren't ready for it. He didn't even say that to the disciples. But that, Ellen White says, this is Desire of Ages, page 190. But that which had been held from the Jews and which the disciples were afterwards enjoined to keep secret was revealed to her. So he told her something that day at that well that he didn't tell the Jews that he didn't tell the disciples, that he didn't tell Nicodemus, that he didn't tell any of those per persons that he had those one-on-one -on -one conversations with. He went all the way to Samaria to talk to a hated woman who he shouldn't have been talking to at high noon, at a well, one-on-one, -on -one, man and woman should have never happened, and he gave her something he gave to nobody else throughout his ministry. Jesus saw that she would make use of her knowledge in bringing others to share his grace. That's the only reason Christ gives anybody anything. So that you can use it to bring others to the foot of the cross. So he gave her something special because he knew she would use that special something to help save somebody else. That's powerful that he gave it to a Samaritan. Something he didn't give even to his own disciples. The Bible says 
uh, to study to show that self approved because he wants us to get ready to be able to reveal the character of Christ to everybody we meet. No two people are the same. No pe two people have the same experience. Everybody is different. And praise God, Jesus tailored his experience for that particular woman. And that's the way it is for all of us. Christ, Christ, Christ tailors his experience for what you need at the time you need it. Danny Shelton and I are friends. But Danny is cowboy boots. And I like cowboy boots. But I can't wear them. Tried to try on some of JD's cowboy boots the other day. Hurt my feet. And I'm not supposed to do that. I'm city, he's country. So he gets a country Jesus. <laughs> and I get a city Jesus. You know what? Same Jesus. Amen? Amen? Shelly's from Texas. So is JD. So is Jim. I'm from New York. They get a Texas Jesus. I get a New York Jesus. Guess what? Same Jesus. But he tailors our experience because everybody's road is different. And it doesn't matter what road you're on because we're all heading to the same place. And Christ uses a term, and I love this. Got to check my time. Christ uses a term that he uses nowhere else in the Bible to no one else in the Bible. It's only used one time. It's in verse 21. Christ says, believe me. You ever use that term? When you're getting ready to get serious? Child, believe me. You got to believe me. Only one time. To one person, and she was a Samaritan. He says, woman, believe me when I tell you. Huh? Believe me. Only one time to a non-Jew on a hot day at a Samaritan well. He says, believe me. Time is coming when everything is going to change. And you're not going to worry about Jerusalem. You're not going to worry about Gerasim. You're only going to worry about Jesus. Aren't you glad that we don't serve a one-size-fits-all God? God tailors our salvation experience for each of us. If you look at how he tre treated Nicodemus, how he treated Matthew, how he treated this woman at the well, how he treated Pilate, how he treated an unnamed Canaanite, each presentation tailored to meet the spiritual needs of that individual. This woman needed to know, one, she was a sinner. Two, that she could be saved. Three, that praying at Gerizim wasn't going to do it. Four, that Jesus, the stranger from Gal Galilee, had what she needed. Five, when you get it, you'll never thirst again. But more than that, more than that, so much more, when you get and receive living water, and we're going to talk about this this afternoon, I'm going to show you something that I just, I'll say, stumbled upon that I think is really exciting and why living water is so important. Because Christ told her that day, when you get living water, you will become a fountain of water. You will become a source of water. People will be able to come to you and learn of me. Now that, ladies and gentlemen, is transformative. Christ is saying you don't become a static pool. You become a source of water. So that people who interface with you will learn about me. And they will learn so much more from me. You become a fountain of water. I want to move into something, but I, 
I'll try to just get through it fast. Um, Jesus gave her that day really the keys to the kingdom. And he showed her the way of salvation. And by the grace of God, his Bible study was not wasted. She dropped her water pot and ran into town. Isn't it interesting? And I don't know, and I've got to check this, if this is just the language that John employs or if it's a commentary on the kind of people that she knew. But the Bible says she went and got the men of the town. Did you read that? She went and got the guys. Now, I don't know if the Bible is just discounting the women who may have come, or since the only people that she was really associating with was guys, that who she went and got. And the Bible doesn't touch on this, but I'm very curious to know if any of her five exes were in that group. But she said, go, or rather come and see a man who told me everything that I have done. And they came. And there was conversion that day. Because a little woman with a bad reputation had met Jesus. And when you meet Jesus, you can't keep it to yourself. And when you share Jesus, his word does not come back void. That's the power of the gospel. I rather suspect that when we get to heaven, we're going to meet that little lady. And we may meet all five of our exes. And we may meet number six, who she never got married to. But what a day of rejoicing that will be. Because Jesus broke tradition and stopped by a Samaritan well. No one is beyond the reach of Jesus. Doesn't matter what you've done. Doesn't matter how many times you've done it. Doesn't matter what you think of yourself. Because even when you give up on yourself, Jesus doesn't give up on you. And he will plant himself right in your way to get your attention. He'll make you have to go around him. And he's not going to ignore you. He will say, I've got water for you. I've got something that when you drink, not only will you not thirst, but you will become a wellspring of waters for others. Isn't that exciting? Amen. Not only do you not get thirsty, you become a river. And others can come to you and find Jesus. Like those in the city of Sychar found Jesus through a little lady at a Samaritan well. Shall we pray? Gracious Father, how we praise you and thank you that Jesus traveled out of his way to meet a woman who needed to meet him. Because that says that Christ will travel out of his way to meet me at the point of my need. Wherever I am, in Jerusalem, Samaria, the other parts of the world, or Thompsonville, Illinois. Christ will find me and call me and give me through the power of his Holy Spirit living water. Father, everyone in this house wants that water. Not only want that water, Lord, we need that water. We crave that water. 
that we may never be thirsty again. But more than that, that through the outflowing of that living stream, our lives will be a blessing and others will see Jesus in us. Oh, mighty Father, would you be pleased to give us living water that we may never, ever thirst again.